Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with John Ketley. John is a serial acquisition entrepreneur, having done over 26, 27 deals and with much more in the pipeline. I want to thank you for being on the show today, John. Absolute pleasure to be with you. Looking forward to our conversation. That's awesome. One of the things I always like to ask people is kind of learn the background, right? Like, how did you kind of get into this space? What got you started in buying and selling companies? That kind of goes back, right, believe it or not, to teenage years in that I left school 15 years of age. No one was going to give him a job. He was wearing two badges that they give the kids these days, you know, ADD and dyslexia. But fortunately, this is like the 1970s. No one knew that that was a bad thing back then. <laughs> and you know what? I don't think they should give them the badges today because they think it's a negative. I actually look at it as kind of a plus. So to cut a long story short, because we were dirt bike racers and we were just a normal family, we didn't have a huge amount of money. So I was kind of hustling even in school to afford to do the things we did on a Sunday. So the hustle part of it, was just something I did from a kid all the way through. So coming out of school at 15 and then going into the workplace, again, really fell into bizarrely buying and selling cars. If we buy them in one auction, I'd drive them to another. I mean, you could get away with driving when you was 15 in, in them days, not anymore. So we were hustling and doing different things. And at that time, I'm going back to about 1979, mountain bikes had just come out. Uh, there weren't really mountain bikes before 1979. So at that point, I'm thinking, that's interesting. So I'd spotted the first of what would be many holes that I've spotted over the next kind of four decades, as it were. So we opened a mountain bike shop and had that for a period, sold that and thought, hmm, that's quite cool. You can start it, you can build it, and then you get a payday of that. So we've done a few of those over the years, like quite a few of them, both across the UK and stateside, where we start build and sell companies. N nothing overly sophisticated, just really a case of seeing a hole in the market, seeing things that other people don't see and go, do you know what? I think there's the, we could fill that hole. So <clears throat> fortunately, I kind of retired back in 06, took a couple of years out, recession kicked in, and then the phone started ringing with people, listen, John, would you come and have a look at this? It's like, Jesus, you're on the brink of the abyss. You know, marriages are all kind of rocky because of the financial part of it, the risk in losing the house. So I fell into turning companies around. And then from turning companies around, the old entrepreneur come in and like, well, actually, why don't I just take some shares in this one and we'll build it up, get it to a point. And because quite honestly, they, some of these couldn't afford to pay me. And everyone likes to reciprocate. You do something, you get someone out of the show, to be honest with you. They want to repay you back. That's how I kind of fell into doing what we now call Weebos, which is working and then they buy out. Or I won't go down that track. So then wind forward again a few years. I've been doing this for the best part of 15 years now. I then started looking at, okay, why there's a ton of people that are baby boomers that i know because i'm the back end of the baby boom myself and all these characters are looking at retiring and i've got loads of friends that are in business and this one's 55 and that one's 65 and they've had whatever they've had for like 20 years 30 years and it's like time to get out and you've got that whole mindset where they've been going on 
on for years trying to hide how much money they're making out of their business. And now they want to sell it. It's not worth what they think it's worth because they've been hiding making any money, man. <laughs> so, of course, there's a fundamental change of lens that we need to go through. And funny enough, I got a call literally yesterday afternoon from a guy that I've known this guy for about 20 odd years. And he's retired once, left it to his two sons. Business is about a third of what it was when he gave it to them. He's jumped back in to help them back out. He's building it up and it's a lot harder because he's been going shooting, riding motorcycles. He doesn't really want to work. So not anymore. So now he's come back and he goes, oh, I don't know actually how to turn this around and build it up to a certain point. So hence that's a call where I'll sit down with him and say, okay, what are we reverse engineering here? What's the end? game on this and that's how i'll end up taking a stake in that company to get it from point a to point b so most of my acquisitions tend to be a 24 36 month sprint get it to a point i don't really take whole businesses anymore because even if they've got a management team you still got to run the buggers and i don't want to do that <laughs> so that's a lot answer to a short question there ron no, that's a great answer so you're doing partial acquisitions you're taking equity for a kind of contract for equity with two outcomes right one they buy you back out at the end of it and the other outcome is you help them sell it at the end of it by and large by and large okay. yeah because again i think there's only two business owners that they're either building it to an exit or they're building a business as, as part of an empire. So the empire guys, I don't generally get involved with other than if they can't get through the glass ceiling. And then what we'll do is we'll come in and I, whenever sort of someone says to me, look, why don't you come in and do a bit of consultancy? And I say, you don't want me to do that because that's going to be expensive. That's like passing a kidney stone. It's, it's painful. Right? <laughs> so you balance that side of it and say, listen, why don't we do this on the upside? I'm going to charge you a return so i can go to the gas station but let's do this on the upside mm -hmm. so inside of these structures of deals you're looking for companies who are they're not all of them are turnarounds it sounds like they're just they're trying to get somewhere they have a vision a an interest how do you source these deals what is the sourcing mechanism that you're doing i think it's largely derived i don't do any prospecting or any much in the way of active marketing social media at all it's really afterthought marketing that i do most of what i get is word of mouth over the last kind of 15 years i do a lot of networking but that's because i'm really passionate about business it, business and doing deals to me is like going fishing for some people or shooting or whatever it is that there it's there love doing deals and so i network with no real intent other than i've got a massive sponge brain that i just want to go and soak stuff up i appear at the weirdest wonderfulest conferences and just talk to people pull one out of the air we went to helitech a couple of seasons ago which is by a, a helicopter show in europe and it's it sits in amsterdam one month uh, sorry one year and it's in italy the, the following year and just having a wander around the helicopter show or the software development show I went to. Now, what I know about software development, you can put on a postage stamp. And I ended up in a seminar that was given by the CEO of Okta, OKTA. Really quite a cool, cool guy. Looked like he'd fallen out of a bush. Maybe that's like an image the CEO is like these days. But you go, oh, okay, hang on a second. I can see where the ball's going. And it's kind of a Greg Rosette's moment is that if you go looking enough and go to different conferences, really just for the crack, as the Irish say, you will see stuff they don't see. And that's really the name of the game. If you're looking for stuff that is a different angle to everyone else and you'll have a conversation, next thing you know, someone's telling you about their Arcoon Heli Tech thing that they make workstations for helicopters so that they don't have to fly the helicopter to get it repainted they can fly the painters to the helicopter inflate a mobile paint booth 
paint it and leave for a fraction of the money. That was a real conversation, by the way. In fact, the same guy got, he's turned into an old friend, a good friend of mine. He was the guy that, I don't know if you know this, but all Amtrak trains go back to the same point in Alabama to get painted. So now he has this colossal inflatable workstation where they can take that to the train and paint it wherever the, the train is. So in terms of deal flow, it's really from networking. And then from networking and talking to this character and that character, if you're in, I think, the M&A arena, you could do worse than describe what you do in a way that everybody gets regardless of who they are. So pretty much if someone says to me, oh, John, what do you do? I'm a business investor and tag specialist. I turn companies around, grow them, scale them, sell them. And as soon as you say that as a handle, they pretty much all say, really? Actually, and then they start telling you all about, well, it's kind of akin to being on holiday and a doctor doesn't want to tell you he's a doctor because the next thing out of their mouth is, I've got this itch. But yes, yeah, so deal flows is not difficult. And I speak on a few stages, different parts of the world. It's funny is Again, uh, networking. Funny you're talking about the uh, not telling people what you're doing. I was in IT for years and years and years. And I actually made it like a family pact that you couldn't tell any of the other relatives I did IT. You couldn't, like I'd come home and end up fixing everybody's computers, right? Like, I can see where if you go in there, like I fix businesses and you hang around entrepreneurs all the time, what do problem solvers have, right? If you identify yourself as the guy that solves problems, what does everybody bring yeah. to you, right? They bring you a stack of problems. I but do, in this do. case, they could bring you deals too. If they, Maybe the interesting thing would be to find out what they do. People love to talk about themselves. So find out who they are, what they do way before they, we ever tell them what you do. And you can be really selective, right? No, no, you, you're on the, man, on the money there, Ron. Yeah. I used to run around with this guy. I say I run around with him. I probably went out with him when I was single for like when we'd go to the clubs together and like meet people or whatever. I went probably three or four times. And this guy was at least a centimillionaire, over a hundred million in, in assets. He was a fellow for venture capitalists, meaning that they just kept him on staff to keep him from working for anybody else. Mm -hmm. One of his main jobs was he had a PhD in biotech, biotechnology type of stuff. And the VC would think about funding money into this you know, company or that company. And uh, his job was to go see if it's a valid idea or if their technology was sound. But when we were at places, he would meet somebody and like, he wouldn't tell them what they did. He would be talking to a girl or whatever. And like, what do you do? And she's like, well, no, what do you do? And you get to like, find out if you liked her before you'd ever tell him. Or, or he'd say, I, I drive taxi cabs. He just like shut the whole idea. I, I don't think he ever told anybody, I don't have to work if I don't want to. He never, I never heard out of all the people that we went around and talked to and even when we were at dinner parties, we need to do ourselves. You never could tell. We never were allowed to even tell him. We called him Sparky, but we never could tell anybody what he really did. Right. <laughs> and so maybe that's the game here is you've got to know that you like their business and it's not, you know, I wash windows <laughs> before you give them the real scoop of what you do there. Absolutely. Yeah. I've told people all manner of things. You're just at an airport or you're on a plane going somewhere and it, it, the worst thing you can do if you're jumping on a plane for uh, five or eight hours and you're thinking, no, I just really want to gather my thoughts. That's what I use planes for, gathering my thoughts. I'm normally a so bit of a social animal, but not on a plane. I'm really not on a plane. What do you do? I work with dead people. That normally kills it. So let's talk about these deals, right? What is the conversation like? I heard some of a, a presentation you did, and I want to draw some of that out of here because I'm a, I think we're right in alignment on a lot of things here. <clears throat> what does the conversation sound like when you're talking to somebody, when you're trying to figure out, is this a YBO or is, I think you call one a, a wit or something like that? Work into, wits. work into sale. Yeah. Work into sale. If it's one, when you're trying to figure out where they're going, how do you get there? How do you figure out what a business owner really wants? I always run the same structure. So I'll have a temporal conversation and I can normally get out of that conversation exactly what their dominant motives are. So the temporal conversation normally starts with, so tell me, wh wh when did you get into this? I've had the business for like 23 years. Really? What did you do before that? Oh, I was an engineer and a so-and-so. So what made you start the company? So what we get from that is actually a ton of stuff that they don't realize that they're sharing with you. They're beginning to tell you a little bit about how their personality is and how they tick. 
because if you can find what the motives are for when they started the business 20 30 whatever years ago so a bit of an i'll bounce between maybe two examples went down and talked to a business owner quite a young guy actually he's only 47 and he's built a really nice business it's a bakery with a dozen shops turns over about seven and a half million sterling makes about 1.4 in net and the short version was it really runs like clockwork and he wants out and he wants out fairly quick why do you want to get out quite quick because that for me is an alarm bell if someone wants out quick I really need to understand the moment because it, there could be a whole ton of skeletons that are in that closet that they're managing to contain and they're going to leap out of there within the next two months. So I want to box that off. Anyway, short version. He said, actually, my father started this business and he had a stroke at 52 years of age and he's like 48 years of age. So right. he's like, oh, okay, right. Because I've I met quite a few characters that are second generation in a business and their father had whatever illness that came their way. Another guy over in Ireland, his father had a brain aneurysm at 52 or 53. And very similarly, these were young guys that had to take the business over, didn't have any options on that. So this guy's was sucked into the business at 18, 19, and has done it for 30 years. And as far as he's concerned, He's been living in a bakery for 30 years and with his children now flying the coop, he wants to have a life. Okay, that's cool. We're getting to the motive of what the drivers are for him. So that part of the temporal conversation was all has told me, okay, so I now know why he wants to move. I know how he's built the business. I know everything that's gone on in there, when things were tough and how he dealt with challenges. We as M&A guys have to really get underneath the bonnet of how the business owner thinks, why they made the decisions that they made. Why did they take any learnings on? So bounce to another character and he had a quite different story, but this guy's like a hundred miles an hour <clears throat> and everything is everybody else's fault. He's not taken any of the blame because this guy let him down, that guy swindled in, this guy did this, this guy did that. And so as you're getting into bed with that guy, you're thinking, now, hang on a second, I can't work with this guy because I'm going to end up being the bad guy. Right. That victim mentality so, I don't deal well with. I just Exactly. And so by having that temporal conversation where you've started in the past and, you know, literally before they started the business, what did they do before that? What did they do before that? This is really valuable intel for you to be able to put the deal together further down the tracks. So, of course, you then bring the conversation up. So tell me, how's it been over the pandemic and the last couple of years? And if the guy says to you, Jesus, it's been an absolute road crash, right? Guy's got no money. The business is upside down. If the guy said, well, actually, it didn't really touch us. He's got money in the bank and he's got a robust business. It's what they say between the lines that we are listening out for. So once you kind of get it up to today, then we want to leap over the present and go three to five years down the track. So in going three to five years down the track, so tell me, how do you see this thing in five years time? I'm nowhere near it. Okay, cool. So you want to exit that. Okay, what do you want to walk away with? Funny enough, I've had two conversations today, one in London and one on the Zoom with somebody up in, in Canada, actually. And uh, it's the same deep dive. So one of those characters, the one that I met in London face to face today, they actually don't want to sell it. They just don't want to own it anymore. Did you hear that? They don't want to yeah. sell it, but they don't want to own it anymore. That's interesting. What kind of a deal are you going to put together there? Now, the, the Canadian one... They're very sharp edged. Three years, they want out and they want X number of million dollars. Cool. I need to know what the motivations are for the future in order to be able to, again, put the deal together today. So once we can do that, then we can reverse engineer how we can get them to where they want to go and then work out how we as the M&A investor can also pay the gas station and 
That's why I tend to sit not so much without right acquisitions anymore. I've kind of done those in the past to a degree, but I mainly, I work into a buyout situation. Either they're going to buy me out if I achieve the goal, or we're going to together build it to a sale. So there's a payday event. So my personal focus, if you like, is a monthly residual up until a payday event. And that payday event, don't really want it to go beyond 24 to 36 months. So 24 to 36 months and the payday event happens. Okay. So yeah. what type of, what's a good industry that like you just totally avoid? Are there, are there industries out there you're like, you know what, just I'm not getting them involved with X, Y, or Z? No, re not really. It's people that, it's certain people I don't get involved with more than the businesses. I mean, if I kind of look at my board here, I've got from the top, there's a quantity surveying company, architect company, childcare company, coffee shops, software developers, IT, media company. There's a myriad. I, I'm really sector agnostic. It's really about the journey and, and what's missing there. I do get pretty excited if they're in a sector that is is upside down and really turbulent, where they're going through a metamorphosis of the industry. So, for example, if you take the Prince kind of died on its backside over the last five years. So we kind of picked up a company. We actually had to do a Phoenix to get them into a different place. And now, oh, where they're in different area, I'm now suggesting to them that we pick up on the print because you can outsource that to the really big guys, get a much higher margin, not carry the 700 grand's worth of Heidelberg print press that they used to have. Yeah outsource that and i think print is coming not coming back in but i think there's a big space for print in certain areas of my i've heard that i've heard that phrase on uh, the training you that i listened to earlier and you just said it now when you said you phoenix a company i kind of assume i know what it is and my assumption is you burn it to the ground and it's reborn right yeah. yes you have to be kind of careful legally <laughs> in so much as that if you've got a company that's that, that's really just about to burn to gra the ground. There's methods, if you like, to, to take the assets, take them out, put them into another entity, uh, let the company that was going to crash and burn, crash and burn, and then you can rebirth that thing and buy the IP and buy certain things off of the uh, insolvency practitioner or see that live again. It's not a practice that's, shall we say, seen positively from the banker's world, <laughs> but it, what it has done, I've done quite a few over the years, what it has done is it saved a few marriages and it saved a few people losing their houses. Right. So to my way of thinking, the positives outweigh the negatives to funding houses taking a bit of a hit. So for our US I listeners, be... you're on the other side of the pond. You're currently in? Just north of London. You're just north of London. So in Europe, in London, there's a registry of all businesses, public and private, that is it of a certain size or all of them, where they have to disclose their financials on a regular basis, quarterly, semi-annually, or yearly, right? Yes. A registered limited company in the UK is where the company has limited liability. So the directors of that company have a very limited exposure to if they build a company and crash it and get debt and all the rest of it, that they can be a little bit hands off. What they did in the UK was they restructured some of the regulations for the banking world so that the banking world circumvented that with personal guarantees, which was the whole idea of the limited companies. When limited companies were born, I don't know, 100 and whatever years ago, 200 years ago, the whole idea was that it would encourage business to flourish, which it did. It flourished right across the land. So it meant that you you wouldn't completely sort of nosedive out of it. But I mean, no one starts a company to go out of business. Right. I mean, you obviously yeah. have scallywags that use mechanism, but those guys are going to do what they, you know, what they do anyway. The vast majority of people, they're starting a business to not have to work for someone else, number one. Number two, to provide something nicer for their family, you know, better quality of life. So 
that's what a limited company does. So over here, you've got limited companies, you've got C's, which are limited liability, sorry, LLPs, limited liability partnerships, a couple of different kinds of entities, but by far and away, the largest number of entities are sole traders. There's just over 5 million sole traders in the United Kingdom. So that's similar to your LLCs, I think, in stateside. The thing I was pointing out, though, is you have a reporting structure that, like here, if you're not a publicly traded company, your financials are private. Yeah. Over there, the financials are public. And I didn't know if that was like over a certain, like, uh, if it was after you make $500,000 a year in revenue or if it was public from the start. Like, when does it, when do you have to start reporting to the public house? If you're a private company, you're a private company end. If you're a limited company or any of those other entities, you have to submit once a year your accounts. Now you can put what they call abbreviated accounts. So people can't really see what the total turnover is, but they can see what the net profit is and they can see if you're carrying debt. So it's enough for people to get a picture. And if you're not doing well and you can't pay your bills here in the United States, you can struggle, shoestring, take mortgages on your house. There, if you start becoming insolvent, there's actually a insolvency division or right? a group of people right. Who yeah. can step in and take control and tell you what to do right absolutely yeah absolutely there's all sorts of mechanisms but having said that it, it's um it's not onerous by any stretch of the imagination no one's going to come in and do those things what what tends to happen and i think this is where i have a bit of a passion for mentoring is that the problem is that anybody can start up a company that's the problem um doesn't mean they know how to run a business and it's what i kind of call the plumber's effect because joey joins a plumbing company and does his apprenticeship and he qualifies as a fully qualified plumber and um he gets a van and then on a saturday he's doing private jobs for his uncle sam and his auntie shirley and then he's doing so many private jobs that he decides to go it alone so then he gets a van and he does quite well because he's quite good at what he does. And now he's got someone else working for him. And then he's got five vans. Who taught him how to run a business? Nobody. <laughs> right. And that happens in pretty much most sectors. I, you know, the amount of IT guys I know that can't work an abacus, highly intelligent guys can't work an abacus. I would imagine that the books don't look like the broker's books, right? The, they don't have really refine what we refer to as your balance statement, your profit statement, your cash flow statements. Those things aren't polished and ready no. to send to you in a shiny PDF. No, to be honest with you, I kind of avoid brokers like the plague. I just don't go anywhere. Near. If it's up for sale with a broker, it's, it, it's got to have been introduced because, I mean, the vast majority of businesses for sale with brokers are still for sale like a year or two years later. And they've got velvet handcuffs in so much as that even if they sell it directly themselves, the broker legally can get still get his monies. So not a huge fan, not saying they're all, all crooks because I have met some really good guys and we're actually putting something together in contradiction to what I'm saying with a broker who has got deals that they can't, that don't fit nice into nice square holes, so to speak. But then generally the turnaround ones where they're an older business used to be the market leader of X was turning over and now it's took a nosedive for whatever reason. And the owner wants 10 times what it's actually worth. So that we're going in for the do turnaround stuff with to directly answer what you're saying. Don't really go near the brokers really tend to get them direct. So I'm kind of going to ask, answer a question I think you're asking, which is how would you get deals without using brokers if you're an m a guy and you want to go do more deals that's a great question if that was a question <laughs> we'll go there i would say it, it's actually quite easy to do you need to go networking and think about who talks to business owners Bank managers talk to business owners accountants talk to business owners cpas talk to business owners, I'm going to go and get in bed with all of the guys that talk to the guys that I want to talk to. I want to get in bed with all the serial networkers and I'm going to give more than I gain. 
and then the giving more than you gain works really fast i'm a serial connector and i put this out listen if you want to connect with someone tell me who you want to connect to generally if i don't know them i know someone who knows how you can get into x or to y and because i've been doing that for like 10 years that's why i, I don't have any marketing the phone rings with more deals than i can handle and i don't mean that in a bullshit oh look at me way i really don't it's just i am old and i have been knocking around for a while but i think if you are an m a person that is not getting the deal flow there's definitely ways that you can significantly change that situation quite quickly but it comes back to really doing the 101 stuff in getting a really good linkedin profile a really good landing page of a website don't make it salesy resist all of that 10 yard long lead page thing resist that it's not hard to bring business let's talk about like with the structure you're in do you spend a lot of time on valuations and we'll go into the next question is like on due diligence like because you're working in a Weibo and like a, a working to, to sell uh, i can see where the need for in-depth due diligence or the need for in-depth like other like all the legal paperwork you have to do if you're going to acquire the entire thing do you spend time on that like like to weebos and wits you, you, you don't have to do a fraction of that stuff which is kind of why that i sit with the with the work in buy out or the work into sale because i'm taking shares in the business i'm not taking ownership of the business mm -hmm. and i don't get in bed unless the business owner and I, or the business owners and I are on the same page. So that comes back to the qualification conversation again. What do they really want? What's their biggest challenges? What's the fastest way for me to get them from point A to point B? So we've established that in the conversation. And in terms of the due diligence side, it doesn't really come about because I'm asking that on day one. If I was saying to Bert or Ernie, Tell me about the company. Okay. And how much is it turning over? What's the roof cost? What's the wage cost? What's the cost of sale? What are all the, what are you spending on a month by month basis? I don't even look at the years, just on a month by month basis. So then they're saying to me, and this is really helicopter numbers for us to put the key in the door to the premises. If I take the rent and I take the utilities and I take all the other things associated with that, it's like $8,000 a month. Okay, cool. That's all I need to know. Wages, what are you spending? Well, it alters from this to that. Okay, average over the last 12 months. Well, about 50 grand. Okay, so 50 grand plus the 10 grand or eight grand, whatever the hell that is. I now know those two elements. What do you spend each month? Well, probably about 60 grand in, in product or this or that. Okay, so one and one is two, two and two is four. I've got the roof costs, I've got the wage costs, and I've got roughly what they're spending on a month by month basis. So then the next thing is, to, how much is selling on a month by month? Well, it's seasonal and it does it. Okay, just average it out. Ah, straight away I, I can see they're upside down or they're positive. So that's as much as my due diligence is out of the conversation. And all the time I'm keeping eye contact, I'm, I'm reading them, listening to their tonality, how they're forming the sentences, I, I, are they telling me the truth? So that's as much as I need to know because there's no point us engaging unless they, they're honest with me. And I tell them that, just be honest. How often do you feel that they're not, right? I mean, is it, is uh, it or they're trying to skim over things, right? They're may, maybe not be totally dishonest, but uh, they're Most really of them not start one. the conversation. There's a good point. Most of them start the conversation being a little economical. And then just by taking the conversation bit by bit, I haven't got anything to prove. And so people can pick that up pretty quick. Oh, right. John's got no ego on this. I never talk about money ever about what I've got on this or that. I, I, I just, don't ever talk about it because I've got enough. Now, that might be a whole lot less than most, or it might be a bit more, but I never talk about it. So because of that, people tend to assume things. And people tend to assume when someone says, oh, yeah, I've got the Porsche 911 and I've got the 15 bedroom house and the 72A, because I go, okay, you don't sound like the sort of guy. Yeah, 
so there's BS. So your BS meter kicks in. Right. And the older you get, the quicker that forms. But there's no reason to BS because I'm helping people get where they want to go. And I think if you're an M&A person, it is about the more people you can help get where they want to go. I know it's an old cliche. The easier it is for you to get what you want. How do you, there's a question stewing in my head. I just got to get it out. Though. How do you avoid, I mean, how do you ensure you get paid at the end, right? You do all this work, you work for 36 months. They say they want to sell and all of a sudden little Johnny decides he wants to run the bakery, right? So I'm not going to sell. I'm going to give it to my son. How do you ensure that you get your exit? How do you get, I mean, you just put three years into growing this. You've created something substantial with the owner's help, but it's a lot of your effort and time and energy too. So What's I do a share part? exchange on day one. So do a share exchange on day one. I'm going to take, and I'm a huge fan of the 80-20 rule mm -hmm. in more ways than one. But generally, that's how I work, the 80-20 rule. I want them to have the lion's share. Sometimes it's 50-50, depending on how in the hole they are or, or what's going on. But it varies roughly from 50-50 to 80-20. Did a deal with a guy probably about seven, eight weeks ago where we did a 60-40. He thought, he was keeping the 40 and we were keeping the 60. And I could see that in his face. I said, no, 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 you're the 60. And you could just see this, all, all the blood return to his face. Because I want them to get the better part of the deal. Because if they get the better part of the deal, they don't care about what I get. And it's kind of the same speech I give to everyone is, look, tell me what you want as the end result. If I get you there, do you care what I earn? Well, well, it depends. But no, 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 no. Let me reframe that. If you get what you just told me you wanted, 10 million, 20 million, 4 million, 200 grand out of debt, doesn't matter what it is. If I get you there and I get you there within 24 months, do you really care what my end is? No. Okay. Well, then let's do that. So this is how it's going to work. I'm going to take 20% of the shares. It's not going to cost you any monies because they're shares. It's just a transfer of the shares from your name to my name and we'll hang that in a very simple share agreement and the share agreement has a get out clause so if we run 12 months down the line and i can't work with you you me we just revalue the company third party we know what it's worth today and you'll just pay me the uplift and that's in a very simple english contract all of my contracts are like two pages max yeah i'm a big because fan of that law is really about intent so what's the intention well and that's where i kind of got the question what are we setting out to achieve how will we know we've achieved it how long do we think it's going to take and what will it cost so i just keep it that simple because it's very difficult you go into a court of law with a very simple i said this he said that the judge looks at it and says, well, you're snookered. That's how it is. I think the more complex you make these contracts, the longer you make them. And I've seen some of these mergers and acquisition contracts. For our roll-up, it was 76 pages, right? Like you're handing somebody something they can't even read on their own without their own set of attorneys. And no, no. Uh, You see, the thing is attorneys are paid by the hour. So, of course, they make two pages into 200 pages kind of a deal. Yeah, they always pre-frame that in the meeting because I've never, I've said this to hundreds of people over the years where you do a contract to, because it's just how I do business. So look, you take this to a solicitor, a lawyer, an attorney, whatever you want to call them, all right, they're going to make more hours out of it. So let's do this on like one page or two pages, right? So that it's so English and believe it or not, I've done multi-million deals on a piece of A4 paper where I've written those four questions. What are we setting out to achieve? How will we know we've achieved it? Literally written it on an A4 piece of blank photocopy paper. Mm -hmm. Got to the bottom of it and said, turned it round and said, so we're setting out to do this. And these are the KPIs. And this is how long it's going to take. And this is what it is. And then I've pulled it back round, signed it. Turn the paper around again. He signed it. Done. That's it. Done. And then, oh, so we've got a biro contract between the two of us. And then we just type that up so it looks more official than the biro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's it. The deal's done. 
Biro, what does that stand for? It's not a US term. Oh, sorry, sorry. That is a brand of a pen. So it's a simple one to two page contract. The reason I asked the question is I come from the real estate world and it's interesting. I've encountered more often than once where we bought a house and decided we weren't going to be the one flipped it. And the person we were selling it to, we were giving them a heck of a deal. But when they seen how much we made, they were like, why should you make so much on this thing? And it was a problem, right? I'm selling a guy a house at 60 cents on the dollar and he's mad because I'm taking a $40,000 check off. He's like, you know, he thinks part of that should be his too. I was like, go find your own house, right? <laughs> and I would never sell to him again. If you play this game with me once, you're on my list. I don't care if you come in here with me and offer twice what the house is worth on the next one. I'll probably tell you to take kick rocks and get out the door. Because I just, if they're planning to play games with you on the first one, they're going to play games with you on every one or later on. So... I was just curious on how do you ensure you get paid? It's, I love the simplicity of a one to two page contract. Both parties agree. And are you taking, like, if you take a 20% equity, are you doing, uh, it sounds like it's equity on the uplift, right? The 20% equity of the company or 20% of the difference you make in the company? 20% equity of the company. Mm -hmm. If we terminate before achieving the end result, it's the uplift. Okay. I love yeah. that. So, That's a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I, again, I think I always think that would I do that deal? Does it make sense to me? Is it logical to me? Would I take that if someone was offering it me to me? And by doing it that way and being fair, not just don't be greedy. Yeah, mm -hmm. if if you're not greedy, people can see you're not greedy. And I think if you can just be comfortable in your own skin and just be you people see that as in you, you tend to think of m a guys or finance guys as these sharp shooting and i'm not <laughs> i'm a little, little fella from a, a new town in england i think those guys find it more difficult to do deals than should we say earthy people because they get it and the funny thing is normally the first thing that a business owner it's almost like they're interviewing you to buy their business or to help them with their business. So I normally do my best to get that onto an evil, an even keel. And then they say, who have you done business with before? Unfortunately, in that respect, I just point them to LinkedIn. I don't point them to a website. I point mm -hmm. them to LinkedIn. And so look, you go into LinkedIn, type in John F. Ketley and go down to the recommendations and you'll see like 50 different companies that I've worked with over whatever period of years. And they're all different companies. And I can't print that. I can print whatever testimonial recommendation on my own website because I can, it's my website, but I can't do that on LinkedIn. So go and have a look at that and phone any of them. That's quite a powerful thing. So that's another thing that I would say when you're on the M&A side of it is do, if you've worked with people over the years, just ask if they'd be kind enough to give their honest thoughts on their, and not just he's a really nice guy. Right. What did I do for you? Put that down. What did you get out of it? Yeah. That's a massive credibility stone to stand on. So yeah, what's you've done so many different industries and stuff. Is there a go-to growth strategy? Like you get in, I know you, you got a lot of strategies for cleaning up and stuff. What's your go-to? Is it go-to growth strategy acquisitions or what's your go-to or is it different for every company? You go in and you grow them to, to get to their exit point. Is there a go-to that you normally, a model you follow? Uh, yes. Yep. The first thing I do is I have got a process that I go through. So the first thing that I do is we create the business canvas. So on the business canvas is it, you're looking at how everything is wired up. So it's just a jigsaw. Okay. You just want to make sure or everything's wired to everything else. What's the core offerings of the business? Who are the clients, the avatars that, and what, who are they? What are they? How do they look? So if you've pulled out, funny enough, we've got a motorcycle shop that works in a particular niche. All right. And I'm a, I'm a motorcyclist. I've been riding these things since I was a kid. So their, their client base tend to be this age that buy one every year 
or if they're that age, they would kind of buy it every three years. And those guys, they'll buy the bike and they never spend another nickel in the store. You work out your avatars and say, well, okay, we want to have our marketing tilted towards X, Y, Z. So if, once you've got your key offerings and who the people are that buys them, what's the methodology between getting that offer in front of those people? So you're literally, you know, a business canvas works. You're literally going by the numbers. So from there, you say, well, okay, so what sort of relationships would we need to have in order to facilitate that whole thing? And then from that, what are the key revenue streams? And are the key revenue streams congruent with what you're saying is your key offerings and who you're saying are the people who buy it? They all in sync. And then you move to the back end of it and you kind of get the picture. So once you've got the business canvas so that everything's linked up, you can generally see where the wastage is or the things that they're not doing. And so to turn a company around that's been running for 20 or 30 years is actually pretty simple if you're coming from the outside. Because they have been in there for 20 to 30 years, they don't realize that there's a whole ton of stuff. It's a bit like you and I. If you went into our loft, how much mm -hmm. crap is in the loft? Oh, yeah. Quite a bit, yeah. right? Yeah. Because we just put it out there and forget about it. Well, so do businesses. Businesses have their own lofts. And there's normally cash lying all over the place in old stock, outdated stock, if it's a product-based company. Or you've got Harry. Harry's been with a company for 20 years. No one really knows what Harry does. In fact, Harry doesn't really do anything. Well, let's release Harry into the wild and a few of the other Harrys. <laughs> and straight away, we just made a fiscal saving. So I can generally bolt money into a business almost immediately by seeing stuff that they've gone blind to. And then you look at, especially if a company's like 20, 30 years old, there's a ton of money sitting in their database. They do not. They spend all their energy getting new customers. And you go, but do you talk to your old customers? This is real business 101. Right. But you'd be amazed. Like nine out of 10 don't have a strategy to talk to their old customers. So we've done quite a bit with gyms, you know, gymnasiums where they do mm -hmm. sell memberships for gyms and what have you. Yep. Those guys spend a ton of money on marketing to people they don't know and virtually nothing for client retention. So their attrition ratio is horrible, but they don't put any energy into it because they don't want to contact the people that aren't going to the gym for the last eight weeks in case they cancel their membership. It's like, really? Why don't we just contact and say after a week and say, I haven't seen you for a week. Can we help you in some way? Keep you on the track. Maybe their attrition rate wouldn't be horrible. Interesting. So, yeah, is the business canvas, then I go to the business playbook, then I go to the sales playbook, and the last thing that I look at is the marketing playbook. And I want to make sure that we're robust with all of those things. Generally speaking, you can double, even treble the net profit of a business in months that it does on a month-by-month -month basis. What does it look like when you start? Uh, like, if you're looking at 24 to 36 months and they're wanting to, to sell at the end of it, there's a whole slew of other stuff going on, right? Like standard operating procedures, all the stuff the buyer is going to be wanting to look at, accounting practices, trying to change your accounting from tax savings to showing off revenue and profits, those type of things. Is that all part of the strategy or do you? That's all part of the financial engineering part. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, that's really getting the reporting structures right so that it reports the right way. We had a, a business recently where it's took nearly seven weeks to get fairly simplistic numbers, which is, as I said to you before, what does the roof cost on mm -hmm. each of these locations that you have? What are the ways? Really simple stuff. It, it took them like seven weeks to produce that. So you've got to get the reporting structure right so that you know where the cash is and where it's all leaking out the sieve, mm -hmm. so to speak. And then what I tend to do is we actually can achieve generally the goals in probably about half to two thirds of the time that we thought because most businesses aren't run well. A lot of these businesses are just doing what their dad taught them, what their granddad Absolutely. taught them. 
and yeah. they just haven't looked at what's available now and you know what's out there right mm-hmm. and they're and they're, these aren't princeton or harvard grads or what's the ivy league over there what's the uh, what's the you know yeah yeah they, yeah i know yeah they're not unis uh, they're not yeah, mbas harvard. right yeah yeah, they're not MBAs. They they basically they own the business, they run it, they have an MBA in business in their own right, blood, sweat, and tear MBA. But as far as being groomed business owners on running a business at the, a, a particular way, especially what a buyer would look for, they're just not. I can see that. What are like? We've been going at it. We're almost at an hour now. We've asked a lot of questions. Stuff. What do we miss? Like, is there something we should be talking about, or is there? I think there's probably a conversation around the M and A community in the small and medium enterprises, and the fact that whilst there is a massive opportunity at the moment with literally millions of businesses that are coming up for sale that that are not sale ready, number one, that will never realise the owner the amount of money that they think they want for it, there are not enough experienced, knowledgeable guys to do business the, the vast majority this is going to upset a ton of people that's probably listening to this the vast majority have come out of the corporate environment and they're taking a corporate mindset a corporate lens to smes it's different it's a different place mm-hmm. smes small medium enterprises businesses kind of up to about 25 million are owner operated owner operated businesses just do not work like the corporates they have a completely different thinking process so that's why a lot of the hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of m a guys are struggling out there and they're struggling because they can't talk business owner they talk corporate and that's why they're not doing the business and they've never they've not learned how to negotiate and it is a bizarre thing i've been training people and teaching people how to negotiate for 30 plus years and i learned from i was really really lucky to have learned from someone who was probably the best guy i've ever come across in the sales arena and i go to sales training every year at this stage of the game do i learn anything new not really but i'll hear a way that someone frames something or I'll hear a, a framing of something where I think, wow, that's really cool the way they come out. I mean, if you listen to Chris Voss on Never Split the Difference, he's coming at it from a negotiating with terrorist perspective. So that's where you're negotiating with someone who is hostile to say the least. And funny enough, with business owners, they are hostile. They're protective of their the thing they've been they get gave birth to it's like a child they've had it for 20 years 30 years 40 years so to learn how to negotiate with someone who's a bit hostile to help them get where they want to go that's what's missing in m a people don't know how to negotiate properly and then they don't know how to tweak it once they've got it and it's funny i've spoken on a few stages over the last kind of year 18 months rooms with a few hundred m a guys that almost didn't want to listen to this old guy talk about working buy out or work into sale because they want to buy the whole business outright on day one and i must have had i've got probably the best part of 30 to 40 deals that are actually in the ether i can't touch because i ain't got the time where they've just switched on and said do you know what if i take the business on i'm responsible for it if i do a weibo he's responsible she or they are responsible i've got shares in this so let me just blow the minds of a lot of m a guys out there just supposing you did a dozen deals where you got 20 percent in one to five million dollar businesses and they only paid you a thousand bucks a month in a retainer there's 12 grand a month right that's enough for most people to pay the gas station and the grocery store Right. And if you realize just four of them a year that you pulled out as little as a couple of hundred grand, you're getting to the gut, the guts of seven figures, four deals a year that realize you're 200 grand a pop is 800. And you'll find that it, it, they're averaging between two and 500 if you're focusing in the right areas. It's not hard to earn seven figures. You just got to have a, an angle that you come in on. 
that's a lot less hassle than going for outright sales. I'm not saying don't do them. I'm just saying for me, I don't want the responsibility. I don't want to run the companies. I want to just get in, help them turn that around, get it to a point over maybe 24, 36 months. Minority roll-ups is the direction that we're doing more and more of. So I'm JVing with M&A guys all over the place. There's Deepak Chowdhury out in, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Deepak and I have JV together with CWW. We're also in the in the midst of putting together a roll up where we've got seven entities totaling about a hundred million dollars. Pull them into a virtual roll up. We've got a target that's interested in buying those already. So that's the IT one. Outside the box. Sorry. Is that the technology one? The IT one. Yes, I think people should be learning more i'm constantly listening to podcasts listening going on courses if you like uh, if you like chris voss look at my podcast i had derek on here derek Gagant. he's one of chris voss's coaches i reached out to chris voss and tried to get him on the show and he sent one of his top coaches on here he has his own book ego authority ego something authority mm-hmm. i'm looking at my other screen here to see if i can figure it but he's got his own book out derek gaunt he was he's one of Chris Voss's Black Swan coaches and stuff. So we had him on here. I'm a huge fan of their method. And so I appreciate it. We're kind of at time now. Let's make sure everybody knows how to reach out to you. What's the best way for people to reach you? John F. Ketley at LinkedIn, or you can email me at john at johnfketley.com. Funny enough, we're going to be over in Orlando the end of the month for IT Serve Synergy. So if you're doing that conference, I think Bill Clinton's the keynote speaker on that one. If anyone wants to learn on the negotiation side and what to do afterwards, we're actually running a two-day training, I think 31st October, 1st November in Orlando. If that's interesting, we'll share the knowledge and give you access oh. into to our community of Wybo, Wits, and Roll-Up. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, I appreciate having you on here today. Hang out for a few seconds afterwards. And uh, do you have anything to add before we go? No, that's it. Uh, we'd love to connect, help more people, go do deals. Awesome. All right, guys, that's the show. Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show. Ask questions. uh, Suggest a guest or even tell me about a business you have for sale and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline and leave us some information. Thank you. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and M&A decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace we have partnered with has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now the investors and entrepreneurs professional mastermind the investors and entrepreneurs professional mastermind combines the traditional peer-to-peer mastermind introduced first in napoleon hill's famous book think and grow rich with accountability partnering where your peers help you ensure that you set goals, take actions, and get results. If you want to scale, blow past roadblocks, and achieve success faster than you might think is possible, I suggest you take a visit over to TIEPM.com. That's T-I-E-P-M.com and check out the Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind.